Hello everybody in the vast grand internet, this is Discodox, back with another reading. Today is chapter 5 of Watch Out for the Lucky. Green opened his eyes slowly, blinking away sleep. He felt warm, which wasn't too particularly uncommon when he woke up, but it was also soft, which was distinctly not a feature that his beat-up old couch typically offered. Sluggishly, he flipped over onto his back, not the most comfortable position with wings, and looked at the ceiling. Turning on his head, eyes catching on the decor of the room he was in, lots of white and purple. A dresser was against the wall directly across from the foot of the bed with a TV mounted on the wall above that. Currently, it was off. The ceiling was tall, painted white with a small fancy light hanging over the bed, also correctly off. Up against the wall, his bed was posted up against were heavy drapes that cut off his view of the outside. It shrouded the room in light shadows. Still, though, the sunlight persisted in beams of light coming from under the mauve-colored curtains. The walls were painted lilac in color with basic mass-printed art hung up aesthetically. Confused, Green sat up, causing the overly soft blankets to pile around his bare waist. Looking down, he saw a bed of white sheets and comforters with a few plum and periwinkle fuzzy blankets tossed over. The carpet was sheer white with a circle rug matching the drapes centered under the bed. His bow and quiver was leaned neatly against his bedside table with an arm's reach. Slowly, the confusion on Green's face was overtaken by a wide smile. Oh, that wasn't a dream. That wasn't a dream! Looking to his right, Green caught sight of the two boxes he had brought from his old apartment the late afternoon before. He had set them down against the wall next to the door before promptly diving into the formerly neat bed, forming the blankets into a semi-nest-like shape before passing out, before even touring the flat he had moved into. After Story Void had offered him the job, Green stood up shakily. He remembers how his hands shook while putting his arrows away and pulling his bow over his head. Shaking his head slightly, he squared up his shoulders and walked through the door as Star Void stepped into the side, letting him pass. The heroes were all still crowded around the window, but had shifted to watch as Green walked through, but none of them said a word. Green paused to look over them all. Some had wide eyes with slightly dropped jaws, while others looked pale. A few had all three. Hawkeye was in front of them all, closest to Green. And even though he still had the dark sunglasses on, Green got the impression that he was speechless. Sitting in his bed now, Green smirks at the idea that Hawkeye could truly be speechless. Tilting his head to the side, Green furrowed his eyebrows. Why was everyone so tense? Did he just barely pass or something? Surely this was just one of many trials they had seen that day. Maybe they were tired? Maybe they weren't expecting so much action or something. Or something. Hakai opened his mouth as if he was about to say something, but he paused as if searching for his words. When he came up with none, he huffed and crossed his arms over his chest looking away. Green felt Star Void place his hand onto his shoulder then. Looking away from Hawkeye and over his shoulder to the masked man, Green saw him shifting slightly in place, swaying from foot to foot with poorly hidden anxiety. Why was everyone acting so weird? He had just survived! Shouldn't they be celebrating? Clearing his throat quietly, Star Void addressed Green. It would be an asset to have you on the team, Pesky Bird. You may take a few days to decide, but I ask that you please highly consider joining. You would be- If I say yes right now, how quickly could I move into the tower? Green interrupted Star Void. Whatever was happening here could wait. Green was tired and already been offered a job. No point in drawing this out when he already knew his response. Taken aback, Star Void dropped his hand from Green's shoulder. Green turned to face Star Void properly. Well- well, I don't see why it wouldn't be as soon as you'd like. He lifted his hand as if looking to the other heroes before looking back down at Green. There's just some paperwork to do, but there's already a few flats ready, so... 
I assume you'll be paired up with Hot Guy, so you'll be room next to him. If you have any things you need moved, we can send someone out to pack them for you. That will not be necessary. How about I grab my things and come back in an hour? That way you can do your paperwork and I can get my stuff here, Green suggested. Store Void hesitated for a moment before agreeing and leading Green to the exit. After grabbing his stuff, signing a few documents, and being given a few temporary passes, Green was led to his new apartment flat. Star Void had told Green that someone would be over in the morning to give him an official tour of the building. He also said if Green needed anything, just across the hall was Hot Guy. Green had been bent to the side to had bent to the side to look around Star Void, who had been standing in the doorway to peek at Hot Guy's door. Surprisingly, the only significant fire that it was his place was a golden plaque with his name etched onto it. Graham feels slightly disappointed. Expecting something more comical and brash like the hero himself. Damn. Graham pulls himself from the memories of the night before, shaking his head to the su head side to side but pulling himself out of his lackluster nest. Feet planted on the cozy carpet, he hoisted himself up, letting the sheets fall away. Letting out a groan, he raised his arms, stretching his back and wings, which flared out, framing the ornate hanging light. Relaxing his body, he realized he felt kind of gross. When he fell into bed yesterday, he only removed his shirt and boots, leaving the rest of the clothes he had been wearing during the whole audition on. Glancing down at the pristine white bedside table, there was an alarm clock currently displaying 8.32 a.m. Whoa, he hasn't woken up that early in years. he normally sleep all day and go out night patrolling. Being a vigilante was a full-time job, after all, and he tried to think of it more like a night shift. Hopefully with being a legal hero, he can patrol during the day now. Green shuffled forward to the boxes stacked by the door, pulling off the top box labeled TAXES. As it was just a box full of random sentimental things he kept around. He labeled it TAXES so none of the heroes would judge him when he walked into the building. Everyone has TAXES! Not everyone has a stuffed pigeon named Moon. Green placed it next to the bottom box labeled clothes. This box was half empty. He didn't know much. Didn't need much. Pulling out a new set of clothes, he turned the turned to the door opposite of the boxes. Walking over and opening the door, Green was he greeted with a huge bathroom, bo boasting both a shower stall and a jet jetted bathtub. A two-bowl sink with a toilet and shelving at the end. It was fully furnished with toothbrushes, toothpaste, toilets, towels, toilet paper, and when Green opened the drawers under the sinks, razors, pads, and other feminine products like makeup, wipes, and brushes. Green scoffed, as if he wouldn't need a brush and makeup wipes. Do they even know who he is? He literally slept in yesterday's makeup, and his bun was looking extra messy, and not in an aesthetic way. While logically he knew the heroes didn't know who would be accepted into the association, there was no need to hide these products under the sink as if they were dirty. Sighing, Green took the swipes and brush, setting them on the counter sink. Sink counter. He reached his arms up, untying his hair, letting it fall just over his shoulders. He lazily used a few makeup wipes to take off the smudged eyeliner and mascara he was wearing. Turning to the shower, Green awkwardly fussed with each knob until he figured out which one turned the water hot. When it was nice and warm, Green took, the, took off the rest of his clothes and threw them into the empty basket by the door, then hopped into the shower. He practically melted. Usually his showers were cold, so this was a nice change of pace. There were two different kinds of shampoo, conditioner, and body wash. Reading the label of each, one was supposed to smell like fireside brawl, while the other was meant to smell like strawberry sunshine. Smelling them both, he noticed that fireside brawl smells distinctively masculine and musty, while strawberry sunshine was actually nice. Needless to say, he would be smelling like sunshine, thank you very much. After he finished up, he dried off, redressed, and brushed out his hair. 
Falling into a low bun at the base of his skull, he lazily fixed a few out-of-place feathers, pulling the ones that were ready and tossing them into the trash next to the toilet. Now he feels much better. Looking into the mirror, Graham makes sure he looks presentable. Today didn't feel much like a makeup day, so he just made sure his outfit was relatively nice. A, long, a black long sleeve shirt tucked into black loose pants. A rope belt clinched them at his waist. Also black. Ah, yes, his signature look. Black on black, because that's what he could afford. Classic. Twisting to look at his backside, he made sure the hole for his wings was clipped cl correctly. He wasn't sure if this tour would involve a lot of movement, but just in case, he wanted to be prepared. All of his clothes were adapted to fit his wings well, so he could have no issue flying at the drop of a hat. Leaving the bathroom, Green continued to explore the rest of the flat. Directly out of his bedroom, Green sees a large kitchen with the dark front door he had entered from the previous, the afternoon previous next to it. The kitchen looked to be stocked. If the bananas and apples sitting on the counter meant anything, it was completely furnished with a large fridge, oven, stove, and plenty of little gadgets like a toaster sitting across the counters. A bar counter separated the kitchen from the connecting living room. Looking up, he sees extremely tall ceilings with joists stretching from each side of the walls. Light fixtures were hanging from them over a large L-shaped white couch. A coffee te table centered on the mulberry-colored eye-shaped rug the couch also sat on. The couches were facing an electric fireplace with a wide TV mounted above. Graham walks over to the couch, running his hand across the cushions, testing if the plushness of it. It's much to be expected. Very soft. The whole place is pretty much what Graham expected. It all screamed, STAGED, as if it was pulled straight from Decorate Like a Hero magazine. Filled with shades of purple and pure white, the colors of the Hero Association and Hero Tower. Any small details like outlet rims and fixtures were plated in fox gold. Looking up from the couch, Green notices light seeping from large curtains hanging, stretching the width of the whole wall. Assuming there was a window behind the huge drapes, Green grabs them, tossing them open to only to be stunned. Where Green expected a few windows or possibly some French doors, he was met with a wall completely made of glass. A large window from floor to ceiling with two glass doors in the center leaning out to a roofed balcony. Excited, Green opened the doors, stepping out into the cool morning air. He placed his hands on the railing, leaning over, looking at the city. He could see everything from here. Or... At least it felt like it. Green breathed in deep, the fresh air filling his lungs. He smiled widely while scanning over the city. This was nice. He made the first to admit things were moving a little fast. This time yesterday, he was getting ready for the audition, and now here he was, moved into the hero tower, awaiting his first official day as a hero. Or, well, you know, sidekick. He supposed he wasn't expecting the heroes to accommodate this quickly. Sighing, he drops his head to look over the cars driving under him. He can't forget his original objective, but the perks of this job were quite something. He can't remember a time he felt this peaceful and well rested. His wings fluttered in jealousy of the wind. He wouldn't give what he wouldn't give to go on a listless flight in the morning breeze. Alas, he can't indulge in his in avian instincts like that. At least he'd be ridiculed. He's surprised he even made a nest last night. He must have been more tired than he thought. A knock from behind him interrupted his idle morning. Sighing for a final time, he pushed off the railing, walking back into his new flat. Peace can't last forever, after all. Jobs require actually working. Lame. Opening his door, Green was greeted with a familiar black, blue, and orange suited man. Hot guy stands with his hand still raised as if he was about to knock again. 
His face is set in a dazzlingly bright smile that doesn't make it to his eyes. Standing next to Hawkeye is a shorter, thicker man in a blue shirt with a white lab coat. He has black trimmed hair and thick rimmed glasses. There's a lanyard around his neck with a badge attached to it, but it's flipped over, so Green can't read the name. The man is also completely ignoring his surroundings, furiously writing on the clipboard with a solid stack of paper clipped to it. Green looks back up to Hawkeye, who had dropped his arm and is now bouncing back and forth, seemingly excited. You ready for the tour, pesky bird? He asks. Though, he knew Hawkeye was putting on an act. Green rolled his eyes. Of course, just let me get some shoes and I'll be all good. Green walks away, leaving the door open. His boots were not far, and after zipping them up, he meets the two outside his door, shutting it softly. Finally, the man with the clipboard addresses Green, though still not looking away from his papers. Hello, my name's Cub, and I'm the public relations manager for Hawkeye, and now you. He lifts a few papers, squinting at its contents, looking, looks up to Green, then back down again. He scribbles something down before looking back up. Green folds his wings close as Cub rakes his eyes over his body. Slowly, he circul circles Green sl silently, every once in a while scribbling something down. Those wings are real, correct? Green Cub asks in a way that didn't sound like a question, more like a... Happy observation. Y yes Green responds. He knows many people don't believe they are real, but at this point, it should be pretty obvious. Green nervously looks over at the hawk guy, who is leaning against the opposite wall checking his nails, looking happily unfazed. Cub finishes his scan by walking back to Green's front, then leaning in close to his face. Green leans back as he glides closer. Do you wear contacts or glasses? He asks, still scanning Green's face with scrutiny. Uh, no? You were wearing makeup yesterday, but, now, but not now. Why? He pulls back, tapping his pen on his papers. Didn't feel like it? Alright, but you know how to apply makeup? Yes? Green replies, tilting his head. Why would he wear it if, if he doesn't know how to apply it? Nodding his head, he leans away from Green. Glancing down, Green sees Cub's clipboard, which has a few upside-down pictures compiled of himself in the hall from yesterday. There are multiple pen marks circling parts of him with illegible writing next to them. He wasn't aware there had been cameras in the hallway while he'd been waiting. He supposed that receptionist wasn't lying when she said the audition had begun at that moment. I can work with this, Cub said suddenly, causing Green to snap his head away from his snooping. Alright, both of you come to my office after the tour, please. And with that, he turns away from Green and Hawkeye. He strides down the hallway, stopping halfway down in his tracks. And Scar? Be nice to him. Disappearing around the bend... Still not looking up from his clipboard. Hawkeye looks up from his nails to Cub, scoffing. But Cub is gone before he strings a sentence together. Confused, Green stands back up straight, smoothing his clothes down, even though they weren't much ruffled. He feels a weirdly violent from being looked over like that. What was that about? And what about a scar? Green asks, putting his hands in his pockets and turning to face Hawkeye. Hawkeye huffs in what could be called a laugh before dropping his arm to his side. He shrugs his shoulder before turning down the way Cub went, pushing off the wall. Getting the hint, Green follows. Well, first of all, you are now the official psychic for the most well-known, hottest, and bestest hero. Hawkeye said dramatically, throwing his arms out to his side, narrowly missing Green, who let out a squawk as he dodged. Huh. Funny. I didn't know I was gonna be Tex sidekick. That's cool, though. Green quipped, smiling cheeky. Hawkeye dropped his jaw in the fence, pointing to himself. 
No! Me! Green threw his head back, cackling at Hot Guy's dramatics. He leaned his hand against the wall to help support himself as he laughed, having to stop walking to catch his breath. Hot Guy pauses as his walking to a huff as he watches Green with his arms crossed, tapping his foot. When Green raised his hand to wipe away a few tears, he saw Hot Guy was smirking with soft eyes. But when he noticed Green was working, lurking, looking his way, he threw a grimace, threw on a grimace, turning his head away. Interesting. I always did think your name made you sound a bit like a prick. Good to know you're actually our one. Humble, too. Green laughed as Hawk Guy huffed, rolling his eyes. Still giggling quietly, Green reclaimed his composure, continuing to walk down the hall. Hawk Guy sighted up next to him, clearing his throat, then continued to speak. Anyways, he started pointedly. Now that you are my partner in not crime, Cub just needs to find a way to make you marketable. Marketable? Green questions as they stop in front of an elevator. Hot Guy presses the button as they both wait for its arrival. Well, yeah. I'm on the front page of every magazine. I deliver press conferences twice a week. Every news station has an hour dedicated to all the good deeds I've done. The elevator dings opening, prompting both of them to walk in. Hot Guy presses the lowest level button, then presses his thumb on a scanner next to the emergency emergency button. The screen turns green and the doors close. That's the emergency button. He looks down at green with boredom in his eyes. And now you just signed up for all that as well. Oh. Green looks down at his feet as the elevator starts to move. He didn't think about this aspect as hard as he probably should have. Are you saying I'm going to be a celebrity? Green asked quietly. Hawkeye looked at him like he was insane, tilting his head with his eyebrows raised as if what Green said was ridiculous. Of course you are. Or, well, Cub will make you one. You won't ha- you won't with the way you look now. Disregarding the insult, Green shook his head. I didn't think of this when I auditioned, he breathed. How did you- What do you mean? Almost everyone in line was trying to be my psychic for fame. Are you trying to tell me you were just there to just become a hero? Well, yes, I am. Will I have to do all of that? Depressing stuff? He asked nervously. Hot guy looks incredulous, staring at Green, staring Green down like he's trying to look for something. Seemingly not finding it, he scoffs, shaking his head, turning away from Green. Ah, the price of fame is a hero. Yes, you will have to come with me and be amicable and likable. I know that must be hard for you. Green opens his mouth to respond before he's interrupted by the ding of the elevator. The doors slide open, and Hawkeye hops out without waiting. The hallway is colored much like everything else in the Hero Tower. White walls, purple rolled-out carpet running the whole length of the corridor. There are a few doors lining the hallway, but Hawkeye walks past them, continuing straight forward. We can continue this later. Let's just get on with the tour. Hawkeye continues to walk away as he speaks. Bidding Green to follow. Green walks next to Hot Guy with his head up, but his mind's somewhere else. While he knew becoming Hot Guy's sidekick would probably come with some media attention, he now realizes he didn't completely think this whole operation through. Twice a week public appearances, magazine headlines, paparazzi following his every move? All that for a few hours of archive sex access. He should have applied for a desk job. Too late now, he supposes. He feels a bit dumb, really. He was a vigilante who helped people first and foremost, but getting 
noticed by the Hero Association was also the main factor. He didn't want to be famous. If he did, he would have just come out with a name and did some more high-profile vigilante business, shown off his wings a bit, and he'd probably have a fan base at some point. But he stayed under the radar for a reason. He had no use for fame. And now he just threw that all away for a psychic job. Ugh, great. Shaking his hands out by his side, Green purposefully pushes the thoughts out of his head for a later freakout. He could deal with all of that later, preferably when he's alone. Trying to come up with a new train of thought, he thinks back to what Cub had said as he left Green alone with Hawkeye. Looking over to Hawkeye, Green's eyes catch on the multiple scars that litter his face and exposed neck and arms. Some of them looked deep and old, while others were superficial and thin. Tilting his head, Green was trying to wrap his head around what Cub had said. Why did Cub call you that? Scar, I mean. Doesn't seem very nice from a PR guy. He asked, pursing his lips. Hawkeye threw his head back with a bark of laughter. That's my name. My real name. Not one of the many the media likes to guess. I swear, if one more fangirl yells Larry when they see me, I'm gonna quit. Do I look like a Larry? I don't think so. He rants. Shouldn't you not be telling me this? Green asks, confused. Which prompts Hawkeye, or Scar, to look over at him with an equally confused expression. Why not? We're gonna be hanging around with each other a lot more. You're gonna learn in one way or another. That being said, Mr. Secrets, he flips around while he's talking, walking backwards facing Green. And while usually he would find us dangerous, Green finds it would be much funnier if he falls. So he lets him. I know Pesky Bird isn't your real name. Or a vigilante name. So, what is it, huh? Green smiles, shaking his head as he rolls his eyes, debating on what to say. He doesn't want to give out his real name, but Pesky Bird was a bit of a mouthful. Nor did he want people to continuously call him Pesky all day. But Scar did have a point. They might as well get to know each other a bit if they have to spend so much time together. My name is Green, he says, but as the name catches Scar's ears, he trips over his feet, falling flat on the ground. Rolling onto his side with a groan, Green laughs at his misfortune. What was that? There wasn't even a fold in the carpet, he giggles. I just... it's nothing. You... I, I just tripped, I guess. Scar says softly. Green stops laughing in that moment, something, sensing something is actually amiss. He takes a hesitant step th towards the man on the ground, but is stopped when Scar speaks again. Anyways, I trip over myself all the time. Let's actually take that tour. Scar pushes himself off the ground with a grand smile, breathing off invisible dust. Green feels slightly unsettled at the, at the complete 180 degrees in his demeanor. Not only had he already stopped laughing, but Scar completely changed the topic, walking away with a pep in his step as if nothing even happened. How odd. Catching up with Scar, Green listens as he explains with enthusiasm where some of the doors and connected hallways go. A few were just random offices and old storage rooms Green had no interest in. At the end, uh, end of the long hallway, they are greeted with tall grand doors. They have the Hero Association logo on each door creepily, in Green's opinion. Watching them as Scar reaches to open the doors. This is our training room. It's basically our place to spar and hone our skills. Every hero has a little section made for their certain ability. Which is why... He pauses as he moves to the side, letting Green walk into the room. This place is huge. Green thought huge was an understatement. It was a whole warehouse. Two, maybe three. And like three airplane hangers all added together. It had 
two whole tennis and basketball courts, a complete gymnastics setup, weights and other gym equipment lined the walls. Hanging from the impossibly tall ceilings were hoops of various sizes. Green found f fought the small shiver that ran through his wings, remembering the events of yesterday. Maybe the smaller hoops could be for the future Green. With pillars that stretched from ground to ceiling, with tight ropes that bridged them. On the floor, there were yards and yards of tape sectioning off certain areas. Some were actually walled off, while others were open, empty spaces. There had to be at least 30 separate spaces, each with different things in the sectioned off spaces. There were other heroes training in many different places. Some were in what Green assumed to be their designated sections, while others were using the community training equipment. None of them even turned their heads when Hawkeye opened the door, keeping their heads down while working out. It was almost too much to look at. Everywhere he turned, there was something new to see. He felt his wings flutter softly when his eyes caught how the, at the very top of the ceiling, there were beams that connected the pillars keeping the roof from collapsing. If Green had guessed, they were very far underground. It's the only way having an open space this huge wasn't a well-known fact of the Hero Tower. What was a perfect place to perch? Wait, no! Shaking his head, Green looked at Hawkeye, who was also looking at him, smiling. Upon being caught, he snorted a laugh and gestured his arms to the hoops. You can go fly for a bit if you want. I can see your wings are itching, too. He points to Green's wings, which were, in fact, still twitching without his knowledge. Sucking in a breath, Green snapped his wings shut. Scar's smiling face morphed into thinly veiled confusion. He dropped his hand, tilting his head. Green threw him a slightly strained smile. No, thank you. I'm fine on the ground. I only fly when I need to, like, in training or on patrol. I don't need to fly otherwise, so I stick on the ground. Scar somehow tilted head Scar's head somehow tilted even more, making him look like a puppy as his eyes went comedically wide as well. I didn't know avians could do that, he replies. I don't think that's healthy. Taking a deep breath, Green tries to settle down a bit, relaxing his wings slightly so they weren't so high strung, giving the illusion of calm. It was his business, and his business only, on why he still doesn't flaunt his wings around. A few years ago, there was an axe sign that g gave avians and other hybrids more quality in the city server. But there were still plenty of purists out there, and with Green's wing type, he had run into quite a few. No need to draw unwanted attention to yourself. It's just rude anyways, really. Don't worry about it, small guy. Why don't you just show me whichever section is yours? Green quipped, hoping to take the questions off him and just finish the tour. Small guy? And it worked! I'll have you know I'm quite tall! Above average, some would say. Scar huffed, waving his arms or hands around as he spoke. Green broke out into a genuine smile. He could say at least, at least say this. Hero was a good entertainment. Shaking his head, Scar turned on his heel, leading Green through the training room. Sometimes he stopped or point out some other people's sections, one of which was Tex, which was an empty room surrounded in glass. Hawkeye explained that it was blast and heat resistant, so he could practice whatever the boys wished without fear of burning someone. He sped past Minos' area fast, as if the area scared him, which, to be fair, was justifiable. It was a grass field with what looked to be bones covering the ground. Feeling a shiver up his spine, Green chose to follow in Scar's footsteps and speed past the zombie hybrid's training section. In complete opposition to Minos' area with Aphrodite, was Aphrodite's. Fitting right next to Minos's. This was an open concept library. The whole area had bookshelves absolutely stacked with books. When asked, Scar said he wasn't super sure what Aphrodite was practicing by having the library. 
But whenever he was in his comfy looking chair reading, Scarlet decided to stay away, just in case. After a walk that seemed way too long, they arrived in the center of the whole building. Green was starting to rethink his wish not to fly around here. Finally, Scar stopped in front of one of the large pillars holding up the roof. He turned to Green with a wild, wide, real-looking smile, then gestured to the section-off area. Being the number one hero did seem to have its perks, as Scar's zone seemed to be at least a full baseball field. Each corner had a pillar with a tight rope stretched between them. At different levels, there were targets of different, differing size. Even the pillars themselves were painted with targets. Several of them had arrows sticking out of them. All bullseyes. Green's fingers twitched to reach for his own bow that he left in his room. It looked to be an archer's dream. Usually, he would just practice by flying around junkyards at night, and natural talents, he suppose. When he chose to become a vigilante a few years back, he figured that if Top Guy could be that good with a bow, it must not be that hard. And he was right! As soon as he picked up the bow he had found, found buried in the back of his closet, he had been a natural shot, almost as good ac at accuracy as the hero himself. Not that he could ever get Hot Guy to admit that. Scar looked at Green with a smirk on his face. He threw his arms over his head with fake yawning. Yeah, I know. Pretty cool. Very big and awesome, like me. He was flexing his arms and stomach in a way that he tried to look more natural. All, me All it made Green do was want to throw up. Suddenly, a voice spoke from behind Green, saving him from whatever this was. Birdie! Okay, maybe not safe, but certainly anything is better than this. Green turned around with a confused gaze as he recognized the accented voice of the hypnosis-powered vigilante from yesterday. Not only though, not only him though, as his sidekick XB trailed lazily by his side. Behind them both, an anxious-looking Queen of Hearts and a rigid-looking Star Void rushing to catch up with the overenthusiastic Swede. Finally finishing his fast-paced journey to Green, he pauses panting slightly, but nonetheless opens his mouth to speak much too quickly for Green to catch anything he says. Seeing the blank look in his eyes, he takes a small huff of breath before starting over, much calmer and slower. Hi, Ben, man. Long time no see, yeah? Feels just like yesterday you, that you said we were all gonna be buddies. And look at us now! He smiles brightly. Green smiles back, though much smaller than the dark-haired man. Corrales, don't scare our poor car worker, XB said, elbowing him in the side. Finally a name for the face. XB lifts his head up a bit to look over at Green. For the first time, smiling at him. Hey, man. I know I was a bit cold to you yesterday, but thanks for believing in us, yeah? He takes his hand out of his pocket, extending to Green, who looks at it, feeling a bit guilty. Was false encouragement that ended up working out still encouragement? He doesn't know. But he does know that these two remember him as a nice guy. And that makes him feel bad. Well, when in doubt, double down! Green raises his hand and takes XB lightly. He smiles kindly, taking a step closer to them both. Of course! I may have had to bail you guys out, but you guys got something interesting. I'm glad you guys made it. I look forward to working together in the future. When he releases XB's hand, he takes Corrales's, who ends up pulling him into a side hug, much to his surprise. The small squawk he let out was between him and the thin air alone. Finally being released, he takes a step back directly into Scar, who was standing way too close. Tripping over his foot, Green yelps as he overcorrects, nearly falling onto the ground. He snaps his wings out trying to catch himself, which works, but also clocks Scar's nose. Regaining his balance, he watches as Scar groans holding his nose. His brain catching up to the events that just transpired. Green bursts out into a real loud laugh. 
Why were you so close? You deserve that so hard. Oh my boy. He doubled over, holding his stomach as he laughed. XB and Corrales were both trying to contain giggles, while Queen of Hearts and Starvoid were looking on with disappointed gazes. The Green didn't notice the suspicious glint in Queen of Hearts' eyes. That suggested that he he agreed with their sentiment. A few of the other people training in the gym stopped to look at the group. Green stood up, wiping tears from his eyes, still laughing. Yeah, yeah, that one was on me. Dang, you sure pack a punch with those. Maybe keep them behind you, yeah? Yeah, huh? Scar joked while still rubbing his nose, which luckily wasn't bleeding or broken. And just like that, Green was no longer laughing. Right. He keep his wings out of the way. He forgot. Sorry, I'll be better at keeping them out of the way. He says with a fake smile. He doesn't want to make a big deal about this and drop the mood. It's alright, me just forgot they were a bit annoying. Noticing the change in Green's demeanor, Scar goes to say something but is quickly interrupted by the hyper Swede. Are you guys hungry? Cause I know XB is, right XB? He asks, punching his friend in the shoulder. In return, his friend punches him right back. Though he didn't seem to pull his punch as much as Corrales, given the Swede small ow 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 while rubbing his shoulder. At the suggestion, Starvoid steps forward around the sleeper newer duo. And beside Scar, he glances down at his wrist before looking down to Scar, who was still dramatically rubbing his nose. How far are you guys gotten in your tour? We can join our groups for a bunch and continue from there if the if that would if that would work for you guys. He offers. Green finds that slightly anxiety-inducing scenario. Scar, having Scar's attention was bad enough, but now more people and hanging out with Starvoid? He really didn't think this hero thing through. Sadly, Scar didn't seem to pick up on Green's hesitation as his face lights up. That sounds fantastic. That way you can tell us how y'all know each other, and we can all get to know each other. It sounds good to me. We kinda already teamed up with X. The more the merrier. KOH added. Corrales fist pumped the air while XB watched him, huffing a laugh. Inclining his head, Green nodded along as if he was excited as well. Great! To the cafeteria! Scar chanted, marching off in the direction of the hallway they had entered from. They reached the elevator quicker than what Green felt like the first time. It was a bit of a tight squeeze getting all six of them into the elevator, but it was a short run, just one floor above the main floor. Walking through the doors, Green got the impression that the level they just came from was for who heroes only, because this place was packed! Three of the walls were completely made of windows, looking looking out onto the streets below. It was very bright with the early morning sun, tables of different sizes, filled with people in suits ch ch chatting with each other. Against the far wall was the wall where Green assumed the kitchen was, as there were several heated tables with different types of foods. But the first thing that caught Green's attention when he first stepped into the room was the smell. Now maybe he was being dramatic, but it was the best smell he had smelled in the long time. The smell of real cooking with real ingredients and spices. It was possible he was just way too used to making ramen every night for the last three years. But hey, being a vigilante didn't play very well. Or at all, really. And odd jobs during the day didn't pay much either. He wrapped his hands around his growling stomach, hoping the group didn't hear him. Being broken from his hungry thoughts, Screen threw his arm out to the large chalkboard above the food line. Ah, yes! It's hamburger day! Watch out, Beef! Don't get too excited! <laughs> Scar said, poking QOHs in the side. His face screws up as his face goes slightly red. He scratches his beard while sighing, seeing the newbie's confused looks. Queen of Hearts sighs louder as Scar laughs. 
Starvoid tilts his head to the side, crossing his arms. Green gets the impression that he's putting on a disappointed stare. Listen, you forget the name of a hamburger one time and you never hear the end of it. He threw his hands up as if angry, but the smile on his face made Green think differently. You didn't just forget the name, QOH. Starvoid that started pronouncing his name as Koi. Ko. Which Green supposed made sense as a nickname for a Queen of Hearts. You stumbled so hard over the name, you just called it Good Time Tasting Circular Beef. And that and for that you will never be forgiven. My real name is Vintage, but I'll never live down the nickname Beef, so comment what you like, I suppose. He clarified to the new sidekicks, leading the group to the starting line, grabbing some food trays. So, would that make you Vintage Beef, though? Corrales chimes in, smiling while assembling a honestly terrifying-looking burger. Beef's head slowly turned to look over at Corrales with fox horror on his face. What have you done? He breathed as Scar started cackling while leaning on Starvoid to hold himself up. Starvoid just letting it happen. Many people stopped eating, turning to look at the group. Both XB and Green just laughed softly while Corrales looked proud of himself. How oh, have we never thought of that before? Scar laughed. You will never live this down, vintage beef. Starvoid added, spurring Scar on with more laughter. Green noticed that Starvoid wasn't grabbing anything to eat, while Scar's plate tilted precautiously. Precariously. Suddenly, two cards landed by Scar's and Starvoid's feet, wedged in the ground halfway. Scar only laughed harder, while Starvoid just looked at the card, shaking his head. Looking over to QOH, he looked as if he didn't do a thing, smiling while finishing off his burger and he was whistling a tune. Now it was Green's turn to laugh along with Corrales and XB. It seems like both Starvoid and Scar were used to almost losing toes to cards, as they also seemed amused. Finally, Scar finished making his food before looking at Green with an odd look. He was picking around the food looking for something he could actually eat. Being avian came with his own challenges, including certain foods he just couldn't eat. While everything smelled amazing, he was very hungry. He didn't feel like spending the night feeling completely awful. He came to the slightly sad conclusion that maybe he should just stick with a salad this morning and stock some more ramen that he knew he could eat in his room. Before he reached for the salad tongs, Scar nudged him, causing him to look up. There's a, there's a hybrid safe table over there. There are three separate tables around here. One for everyone, one for restic restricted diets to vegan or pescatarian, and also a hybrid safe table. We take hybrid safety seriously, even before the law was signed. They serve the same things over there, over there as over here. Let me show you. He smiled as he started walking past the whole line of people. Surprisingly, XB followed them as well. Now, I didn't know you were a hybrid. Green voiced as they followed Scar. Really? It plays into my power. I'm a guardian hybrid. That means I'm also forcefully pescatarian. He smiles as they come to stop before a buffet of food that looks similar to the last place they were, but with certain hybrids listed in front of the dishes naming which can eat which safely. Now that XB mentioned it, it made a lot of sense that he was a guardian hybrid. A lot of them were known to have the ability to slow people down when in water, along with a transformation that turned them into mermaid-like creatures when submerged in water. And while they usually had outward features such as gins, fins and gills, XB having possibly none of them added to his powers as he's, he's opposed. Quick escape if he was near water, nobody suspecting he was a hybrid. Humming, Green started looking for Eevee and safe food, piling on his plate. After the two finished, 
Sarah led them back to the others of the group, sitting at a table in the corner big enough to fit all of them. All of them dug in, well, except Starvoid. After they were all done, they stayed seated, just taking talking for a few hours. Green learned the rest of the heroes' real names, like Minos being Cleo, Aphrodite being Joe Hills, and Tech being just Tango. He didn't know exactly what he expected from the heroes, but being a s normal wasn't it. When fighting on the streets, they always seemed so stuck up and posh, following the rules, flashing smiles to the cameras, making boisterous statements that turned into clips on the internet later. He wouldn't say they were all completely nice to him. There were a few heads turned in the cafeteria when the ex-vigilantes walked by. But Mia's heroes, the ones who gained the sidekick, were being very generous with their time. Green didn't know what to think. Every once in a while, he'd look over to Starvoid, or Izuma, as he learned his name to be. It was a traditional, apparently, for the type of hybrid he was. Something called a Voidwalker? But he explained no further what that entailed. Green had never heard of that species before, and judging by the look on Corallus and XB's face, neither have they. Beef and Scar just continued off as if it was a normal admission. Which for them would be, since they've known Izuma for so long. To see if he had any input into the conversation. But after learning his name, he seemed content just to watch the group talk. He sat in a straight posture, inclining his head to whoever was speaking at the moment, never adding his own words. That is, until a quiet beep came from his suit, which seemed only Green and him heard. Exuma raised his arms and looked to the inside of his wrist, using his other hand to swipe around as if he were using a communicator. Green supposed w wasn't, which Green supposed wasn't a far off guess as he let his arm drop, addressing the group. Scar, it seems you and Green have a meeting with your PR manager soon. He spoke to Scar alone. Green huffed at the act of being ignored. What? It's not even. He pulled out his own communicator, the and and bulked at the time. It's two o'clock. We've been hanging around for like three hours here. Scar shoved his comm back into his pocket, grabbing him both his and Green's tray. Green watched as he tossed them 30 feet away where they landed directly on the stack of dirty trays perfectly, surprising everyone except Izuma. We gotta go, guys! Cub is gonna be pissed! He mumbled the last bit as the group recovered from the impressive aim. Then they started laughing as he bent down, Green, grabbing Green's hand and bucking it to the door. Green could barely keep his feet under himself as he tried to pull his arm away, but it was like fighting a cement wall. He wasn't going anywhere. When they finally reached the inside of the elevator, his face was beat red from exertion, and his wings were raised as if trying to make himself bigger. Scar dropped his hand snickering while Green tried to catch his breath. He noticed that Scar didn't even look like he was winded. Never do that again! He shouted, attempting to smooth his feathers out. Scar ignored him, pressing one of the many buttons before once again using his thumb to scan before the eh elevator started moving. Sorry, not sorry, Barty. We've got places to be. He chuckled at Green, not becoming, not very becoming to be late on your very first day. He leaned against the wall, smiling at Green. It's not my fault you can't tell time, he chirped. Walking up to Scar, placing his finger against his chest, purposefully measuring his breath, pretending he wasn't still out of breath. Well, I'm always late, because I can be. I'm helping you, G-Man. You are so annoying. Yeah, yeah, you love me. You wish. I just met you. Don't be like that. We've been nemeses for years. You wish you were my nemesis. Well, at first, Green was upset. It was now getting increasingly harder to hide a smile at such a dumb argument. He didn't really care about being forced to run like that. If anything, it was pretty fun trying to keep up. 
The two were so wrapped up in their squabble, they didn't notice when the doors finally opened. Nor did they notice the stout man standing there with a clipboard, an exasperated look on his face. He was tapping his pen on the clipboard, just waiting to be noticed, which he quickly realized wasn't going to happen when the two men started the cat fight. So he drew out a long sigh before loudly clearing his throat. Both Green and Scar stopped where they were, hands wrapped around each other to strong arm the other. They shared a glance before letting go, snapping t to look at Cub, who just sighed again. I have to deal with another one? Great, he said to himself. Follow me, please. He looked back down at his papers, tuning a few- tur turning a f Turning a few over, then writing on a few more. Scar followed him into the office first, followed by Green. It looked like a normal office one would expect from a public relations worker for the Hero Association. Very high floor level, made mostly of windows that overlook the city dramatically, and a sleek desk in the center. But when Green walked up to Scar's side, he saw a few things that truly stood out. Namely, the twenty or so outfits floating around the room in various states of completion. They had a faint blue glowing aura around them, hovering up and down slightly. Sewing supplies were strewn around the room and over every available surface. A few of those are floating as well. A thimble floats past his eye line and he follows it with his head as it passes. Scar leans down as he does so. That's Cub's power. He's a Vex hybrid with small level telekinesis, but he mostly uses it for sewing, he says, poking the thimble as it passes him too. Cub was in the center of it all, also with the thin blue aura around himself, and for the first time since Green had met him, he pulled out the cl he put the clipboard down. Alright, Green was it? Most of the outfits you've been wearing f you'll be wearing from here on uh, have already been sent to your room. Along with those, along with those are your other mandatory respawn bracelet and identification badges. I have not, however, sent your true hero outfit as it is not finished yet. But here's the concept. As he spoke, he gathered a few of the outfits out of the air, laying them over a chair behind the desk. Green was starting to get a little nervous. Every outfit he was seeing was very pink, which really is. Which really, which isn't really an issue, it's his favorite color, so really that's a win. The issue was that most of these outfits were very dressy, no loungewear in sight. He looked over to Scar, who seemed just as confused while looking around the room. Cub, what is all this? Isn't he just supposed to be a normal sidekick? He doesn't need all this gear. He asked, pointing to the stuff on the desk that Green didn't even notice. It had weapons on it, again, all either pink, red, or orange, though so some had blue as well. There were some knives longer than Green's forearm, smaller bows that could pass as a slingshot, honestly, and a few utility belts with weapons he doesn't even recognize. Normally, yes, psychics are given the basic essentials until they can get contracted as a hero, but he is different. He grabs a shirt and turns to Green, who strains up nervously. Cub turns the garment back, looking at the wing holds. He is yours, I kick. His eyes flick up to Scar. He's Hawkeye's psychic. I don't know if you realize what we got here, Scar, but this is a gold mine for the Hero Association and you two. You are already the most famous and successful hero, and now you have a sidekick. He has to be just as as marketable as you. Yes, I know that, but what does that have to do with the discount ha Hawkeye outfits? He pulls one of the shirts out of the air, and now that he mentions it, Green sees how fam similar it is to Gr Hawkeye's sig sig signature outfit. Cup sighs, setting down the shirt he had. Waving his hand, two of the mannequins from the corner of the room fly over to rest in the center. The taller one has Hawkeye's current superhero outfit with a few tweaks to it, such as a few pink details that used to be black around the waist. But the shorter mannequin showed off a superhero outfit that had motifs of Hawkeye while being different, 
Like the fact that Hot Guys is mostly black, this is mostly white. It was sleeveless, tied around the neck with a bow in the back. There are a few white fingerless gloves stretching up past the elbow and halfway to the shoulder. These are also these also had bows. A pair of high waisted white baggy pants cinched around the calves, much like hot guys, yet these were sent over a pair of orange fishnet tights. A belt held them above the hips with a heart. Shaped buckle with the blue and orange of hot guy. White combat boots tied to look together. Laced up with orange and pink laces. Resting on the head was a pink pair a pair of pink sunglasses, heart shaped. Had and to finish off the look, there in the center of the shirt was a a rounded off version of Hot Guy's loco. It almost looked like a heart. Scar's jaw dropped as he stared at the knockoff high hot guy outfit. While it did look different, the similarities were not lost on any of them. What is this? He shouted, throwing his hands out. Green just stared wide-eyed at it. He felt his heart start to speed up. He was really starting to feel like he bit off more than he could chew. It was a great outfit. Very much something he would wear, but this was all moving a lot faster than what he expected. It's a new uniform for the famous hero Hawkeye's new sidekick. It's for the sidekick... Cute guy. He smiled cheekily while the shorter mannequin flew to his side. If you are worried about him getting cold, I'm working on a sweater for him. A pile of bulky fabric lifted from the desk, settling over the mannequin's shoulders, then slipped off. And an off-the-shoulder, oversized, half-pink, half-blue cardigan was wrapped around the outfit. It had heart-shaped buttons and hugged the waist. I'm not worried about him getting cold, Scar shouted, sounding almost hysterical. You steal my brand for this new, brand new sidekick that I didn't even want? Then you take my name too? Cute guy? What kind of name is that, cub? Green watched as Scar yelled at Cub, who was just watching him with lazy eyes. With an exhale, Cub pinch pinches the bridge of his nose while he grabs his clipboard before walking up to Green. But before he even gets there, Scar blocks him, stepping in front of Green. Seriously, Cub, don't ignore me! When at first Scar and Cub exchanged, Green couldn't hear. He was thinking very loudly to himself. He fucked up. The whole day was starting to crash down around him. He really did this. He's a hero now. And he's got to uphold all the hero look and rules. He went from fighting heroes for fun last week to now sitting and having brunch with them. He knew their names. He's Hawkeye's sidekick. They were literally play fighting like 20 minutes ago. Green could feel his wings wrapping around his shoulders to trying to calm himself down. His breathing was getting quicker and quicker as his eyes scanned the roof for a place to hide. When that was a bust, he started slowly backing up to the door, hoping that neither of the men in the room would notice. And while he wasn't noticed, he didn't make it to the door before he was addressed. Scar, leave it be. This was a direct order from higher than you or me. He will be just as popular as you, whether you like it or not. Now, Gran. He pushed Scar to the side, who just crossed his arms, and huffed at the dismissal. Here's a packet of approved makeup looks that you will be required to wear when seen in public with Hawkeye, as cute guy. There are some pictures, as well as all the required makeup to produce these looks, have been sent to your room. One last thing, I need to measure your wings one last time for a better quiver for you. Not noticing Green's uncharacteristic silence, he slipped behind Green before he could even protest. Now, Green wasn't sure how much the people around him knew about avian hybrids, but he was going oh, he was going to go on a limb and say, Cub didn't know much. Green had his wings curled around himself in what he thought was an obvious sign of distress. Catching eyes with Scar, Green saw his eyes go from pissed off to widening with shock. Cub, wait! He started too late. Cub placed his hand in the center of Green's back, holding up a measuring tape 
unaware of his turmoil, immediately Green's eyes dilated. He squawked, jumping away from Cub, chittering angrily. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't breathe. It's too much. It's all too much. He backed up into the corner of the room, knocking over several mannequins in his effort to get further away. Though still trying to keep an eye on both Cub and Scar, all he could hear was the blood in his ears and his own distressed coos. He kept scanning the room for an escape while S Scar pulled Cub to the front of the office away from Green. He thinks he can maybe see Scar's mouth moving, saying something that- but he doesn't understand. He wants out. Finally, he spots it. A singular open window directly behind the desk. Perfect. Beelining for the window, he hears someone shout, only spurring him on more. His claws push the window harshly until it's, it's as wide as it will go. Then he jumps through, the, through with minimal effort. He feels the air whip past his face as he plummets to the ground below. He flares his wings out, catching the wind and flinging himself up past the window he just jumped out of. He still can't hear, but at least now it's because of the wind rushing past him. He circles the building until he sees what has to be Scar's balcony, since it has a has broken down targets piled on it. He goes to the opposite side, knowing it's his room, and lands on the balcony. When he opens the door, he knows it's his room by the stack of boxes by the front door, overflowing with white and pink clothes. He doesn't want to think about all that right now. It's all too much. He makes a beeline for his room, taking all the blankets and pillows he passes on the way there. He rearranges them in the corner of the room furthest from the door. All the while, he's chirping in distress, calling for people he hasn't seen in over three years. He upturns the box of sentimentals he brought from his apartment, taking the stu stuffed pigeon his sister got him and curls up in the very nest-like bed in the corner. He feels a few tears come to his eyes. His breathing had gotten a bit better now, now that he was alone and in a nest. He missed his flock. He hadn't needed them in years. So busy trying to find them, he didn't even have time to grieve. He takes a deep breath to calm himself. He certainly, he certainly bit off more too much for himself. It's only day one and he has a panic attack because of all the things they expect of him? Not only is he expected to do all of this hero business like High Guy, but he also has to get the information he needs about his flock too. He coos sadly at the thought, gripping Moon t closer. He will get his flock back I if it kills him. Mumbo deserves it, as his impulse and certainly his own sister. But this is turning out to be much harder than he thought it was going to be. Stupid bird. He really didn't plan his whole scheme very well. And if that w and if for that, he's paying the price. Green falls asleep, feeling a single te tear slide down his cheek and onto the pillow. He, he dreams of his flock and the day he realized they were missing. Tossing and turning as the afternoon turns into night. And that was the very long chapter 5.